Could your presentations be more engaging? Do you want to connect better with your listeners, but don't have much time to write your speech? Well, then get ready to learn simple techniques that will help you immediately. In this session, you will learn tips to save time crafting any type of presentation, gain insights into simple structure and organization, and discover the seven main channels of listening to enhance communication skills. Our speaker series guest tonight shares insights with us from over three decades as a top-rated international presenter. Shale Rausch is the CEO of Sparkle Presentations and has given well over 3,500 live presentations in 14 countries and has been a virtual presenter for 12 years. As a keynoter, Cheryl has opened on conference stages for Dancing with the Stars, Marie Osmond, and presented on programs with Olivia Newton-John, John Maxwell, Marcus Buckingham, and others. Her clients have included Camp Pendleton Marines and the U.S. Navy, Deepak Chopra's lecture team, Intuitive's TurboTax executive team, PMI, and the University of Pittsburgh. She has started the Speakers Bureau at the U.S. Olympic Training Center in San Diego and coached 30 Olympians. The National Speakers Association honored Cheryl with Member of the Year in both San Diego and L.A. chapters, plus the Golden Microphone Award. In Toastmasters, she earned the Elite Accredited Speakers designation judged in six categories of presentations. There's only been 93 honorees since 1981, and Cheryl is still the youngest woman to earn the credential in 1993. A 17-time published author, The Heart of a Toastmaster Book, received Best Anthology from the International Book Awards, showing us how to design and deliver engaging presentation with our session, Speak Like a Pro. Let's welcome Cheryl Rausch. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this very special second Monday speaker series event. Really great to have you here. Be watching the chat box, as Karen had just said, because there are going to be documents loaded up in there. So again, if you haven't downloaded the handout, this is a really good time. This is what page one of it is going to look like. Meanwhile, while you're downloading that, I'll do a little further storytelling for you. This is me. Yeah. Well, okay. It was me. I was probably what, three, four years old. It might surprise you, especially after you heard that introduction from Karen, that I was painfully shy. My mother was an Avon lady and she would be standing behind, oh God, I, I, I would be behind her skirt tails, put it that way. Ding dong, Avon lady. Yeah, I was painfully shy. And it wasn't until in high school <laughs> that that was elevated because I was commissioner of PEP for all of of the big sports events, 2,000 people in our auditorium. And of course, we would call them colleagues today, then they were fellow students, my goodness. Well, then I went to a networking meeting for the Chamber of Commerce, and there was a woman who came up to me and asked me what I did. You know how we typically do in small talk. And I said, well, I'm, I own a graphic design studio. Really? What are your greatest challenges? And I said, well, I have five employees of whom each are more senior to myself. And I was always taught to treat our elders with respect. How do I give my employees feedback, take care of the clients, and also show respect for my employees? She said, you might want to come to this eight-week communication skills series that we're having, and I'll even buy you breakfast. There we go. This is El Fandango Mexican cuisine in Old Town, San Diego, which is where I'm born and raised, <laughs> my palm tree. And, and that's where I walk through the doors on that March 15th, 1987, during a speechcraft program. I didn't even know what I had walked into. I knew that I needed to improve my own communication skills. They were applauding for everything. It was a crisp California meeting, which, you know, those of us from California know that that's probably like 50 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I knew that I'd found my place. I had no idea how strong my fear of public speaking really was, though. I cried my icebreaker. I, did anybody else cry during their icebreaker? It was ugly. I had tears flooding down my face. I was holding onto the lectern as if for dear life. We call it the white knuckle speech. And there are members still in that club that will tell you, oh, yeah, it's true. I was there. I was there. It was ugly. 19 Oz, by the way, that, that icebreaker. 
Second speech, I still cried. Third speech, I had tears in the corner of my eyes. I was afraid of blinking for fear of splashing people who were sitting close to me. But 7 a.m. meetings with huevos rancheros and tortillas flying across the room, waiters dropping huge platters of food and silverware. And if you're not a morning bird, if you can speak through that at seven in the morning, I figured this is incredible practice. I could speak anywhere, anytime. Now, what I also learned is what I should speak about and what perhaps I shouldn't. So I don't know if you're using Toastmasters for that, but you might consider really honing in your presentations. What should we, you should be talking about? So part of my journey then, and we learn in Toastmasters and we polish up our skills, we need to take them outside of the organization, into our community, into our organizations, whatever that might be, to sell your product, your service, your offerings, whatever that it might be, and take a Toastmaster with you so that you get credit on your Pathways project. And if you're going for the accredited speaker designation, which is for professional presenters, then you need to give at least 25 outside presentations over the course of a three-year span. So the journey continued. I was given two weeks notice from world headquarters when they needed a backup speaker. One of the speakers off of the international convention had just canceled. There was something that came up that he couldn't attend. And TI world headquarters staff called me and said, could you? And I said, let me check my passport. I'm good. Canada, here I come. Oh, Canada. Happy Thanksgiving to our Canadians today. And it was 850 people filled this room. Now, I share this with you. I share my journey with you so that you know if I can go from crying my first three speeches to world stages, if that's your goal, you can do it too. It, and thanks to this organization, it gave me the confidence first and the skills second. What I'm sharing with you tonight, I did not learn in Toastmasters. I've learned it since I joined. So I'll be sharing some of my top tips with you and help shorten your learning curve. This is my largest audiences to date, two conventions back to back in the Salt Lake Palace big sports arena where the Utah Jazz play and 5,000 women in sales. And then four days later, another 5,000 different, different group audience and keynote closed, keynote closed for both of those could never have done that had it not been for the confidence building and practice in our Toastmasters environment. So please maximize your Toastmasters experience. And if you're not yet a Toastmaster, all right, then just pop Frank or Karen story a note and they'll make sure to give you information regarding this club. I've also spoken around the world as heard in the introduction and this happens to be in Manama in the capital of the kingdom of Bahrain. So it was absolutely beautiful to speak on programs and travel the globe. But let's make this all about you. Now that you've had a chance to download the handout, Karen, at this time, go ahead and put the mind mapping worksheet in there too, because that's where we're headed straight away. So do you have trouble organizing your thoughts or ideas, right? Or if you just go out to buy some snacks and you drop a hundred dollar greenback and you forget to get your change, <laughs> this might even help you with a little bit more memory and recall. Maybe you don't have enough time to write your speech. Do you have, is that true for you too? How about you're sitting in the audience and you look at the agenda and they had a cancellation of a speaker. Could you step in using these techniques that I'm going to share with you in this session, you will be able to. I'm confident in that. So here's what we often do. We start with the pad of yellow paper that's lined, right? Have we done that before? Mm -hmm. Guess what? It clogs up the brain. The, even though the color yellow and color psychology promotes feelings of cheerfulness and alertness, the lines slow down our brain. When we see something like the lined piece of paper, whatever color that it is, it goes to our left brain, which is the logical, linear, things must be in order place. So nod your head if this is true. Yeah, engineers, you know what I'm talking about. Well, that's great 
maybe to do as a second activity, not as the first. So for instance, instead of using this line sheet of paper, and I know we can be sitting there, we can start crafting at our computer or on our smart device. Instead, here's a brilliant idea. Tony Buzan, the creator of the Mind Map, was one of our Golden Gavel Award recipients in Washington, D.C. at that particular convention. And it was wonderful hanging out with him and we had dinner together. But he created what I'm going to be sharing is a very simplified version of the Mind Map. So on page two inside of your handout, we're looking at what some people call that happy sun. All right, so we're going to jump into this and I'll come back to that and how you can use it. So we're on page two. Here's the mind map. This is a worksheet placed in the chat box for you. And how you would use that is in a horizontal type of format. So it, it may have loaded vertically inside the chat box, but you actually want to print this out because there is something very magical about using a pen on the piece of paper, which taps into your right brain which is where all the creativity and spontaneity and the innovation and the problem solving techniques, all of that comes from the right brain, free association. So mind mapping, here's what we do. Let's say for instance, that you are getting ready to craft a presentation, regardless of how long or how short. You put something that identifies what the topic is inside of that middle section. I don't know if I would do the entire speech title, I don't think I would. I would do what is the what is the area? What is the main topic, but not the title of the presentation? It could be one or two words from your actual presentation. Better yet, because the next technique that I'll share with you is do not name your speech. Not at the beginning. Well, come stay with, take a breath. I, I may be shifting some paradigms for you here, but stay with me because this really makes things easy for us. Once you learn these techniques, you'll never go back to lined pieces of paper again. So put whatever it is, that topic of maybe your next presentation, just kind of a, an idea. With this then, at about the mm, one o'clock, 1300 line, you actually write then on that line, and as you are rotating the piece of paper to keep writing around clockwise, turning the piece of paper, psychologists tell me that this balances the brain. It actually makes the synapses start clicking, clicking, clicking. It balances and you're tapping into 100%. Well, now Einstein wouldn't, wouldn't say 100%, but a heck of a lot more than we currently do. So you keep writing a different idea, even if it's not a good idea. Write it down because in this process, you do not edit, you do not judge, you just write it out free association, you keep going around, 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 around the entire circle. So by the time that you're finished, you have information that if you're in sales, you could overcome the objections of why someone would not want to buy it because maybe something negative showed up on this list. So you go around and you fill it in. And if you get stumped, turn to someone who knows nothing about what you're working on. Just tell them the concept, no other details and say, what do you think of when I say indigenous people's holiday? And they may rattle a few things off that you hadn't even thought about. Or today is Canada's Thanksgiving. So what do you think about when with that and then they add to your list they tell you and you write it in and you can do some beautiful table topics and copywriting from this just by linking them together here's one of these activities that i did do i was brought in by one of the large chamber of commerces in southern california and my topic was speaking the topic not the title the topic was speaking for business owners. I did exactly the process that I just shared with you, starting at the one o'clock position, going around the circle. As it came together, I had everything for my speech. Plus, it inspired me to create a 48-page workbook, a guidebook that then I sold that day. And this is eight and a half by 11 format. From that mind map, ooh, give me a thumbs up. Is that pretty cool? Yeah. So if you're thinking you don't have a book in you, 
Sure you do. Maybe even a workbook, maybe even a curriculum guide to go with what your presentation is about. From that, it stemmed another manual for Toastmasters that had been sold at the conventions, plus a, a CD with, gosh, MP3 files. And then that spawned the USB drive or the electronic files. All of this has been approved by World Headquarters and sold at conventions. All right, so let's come back to this for you. So now that you've started your mind map and see in the upper right hand, it says organizing your thoughts. Number one, begin with the mind map, flush out the ideas, tap into the power of your right brain, all of that free association, the creativity. Then number two, you sort so you can you can put it onto other sheets of paper if you want. Maybe here is where you start working in a Word document before you start designing your PowerPoint slides or your keynote. You chunk them, again, similar concepts, that's called chunking, and then start organizing your thoughts. All right, so let's say that that speaker at your meeting has just canceled. You could draw yourself one of these mind maps and start putting in the ideas that you might use in a five to seven minute presentation. And now I've even done this in my <laughs> overcoming negativity in the workplace seminars that corporations hire me to come in and creating a positive work environment. Only I don't give them this worksheet. Mm -mm. I give them a blank sheet of paper and I say, okay, you know, draw a circle in the middle. All right, now draw a whole bunch of lines coming from it like it's a happy sun. So they trust me. They do. They draw it out and everything. Now I say, now in the middle of the circle, put your name. They still trust me. So they do. <laughs> then I say, on each one of those lines that you just drew, name one positive thing that you like about yourself. Yeah, you could hear the groans in the room. Oh, no, I put too many lines. Well, that's why they're in the Overcoming Negativity Workshop. That's a whole nother topic. You could do this with your kids, by the way, and have them put their name in the middle of the circle and then write it that they say, what do they love about themselves? What this will do for self-worth and self-esteem. Now, mommy and daddy, if you do this, make sure to put your sketch up on the refrigerator too. This will remind you how to use the mind mapping and be creative. If you have, you're thinking about Halloween and a Halloween party, then Halloween could go into the middle of the circle and you start crafting all kinds of ideas of what could you do for your Halloween party. All of it. Then you start organizing in relevance. And then number three, you craft a structured content, which we'll take a closer look at here next. But this would be the opening, the body, and the closing or conclusion of your presentation, which of those items are going to go where? At this point, this is often where I start a new slide file and I start putting things in order because in PowerPoint, I can shift them around. I can come back and add the design and add the images based on what, how am I tailoring that particular presentation? Then number four, and we're going to take a look at this technique last, is to include each of what are called the listening modalities or the channels, communication channels. So on the handout, that's going to be in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. So make sense? Make sense? Yes? Okay. Great ideas. Light up the chat. How are you going to use this? Especially if, if you've got a presentation coming up this week, always start with the mind map. It's going to be so easy for you. Now, how do we start organizing it? Again, speak like a pro. We always have an opening of body and a conclusion. In the adult learning theory, which we learn in Toastmasters, is the tell them, tell them, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them, because we need to be reminded what was it that we just learned. And you'll see how I also do that signposting and summarizing for this particular presentation as well. I do that in all of them. If we don't wrap up and summarize, quite often our audience doesn't realize what it is that they learned or it's not concrete in their left brain where they're going to be storing it. So we have the opening. Each of these is going to have, let's call it a percentage for a formula. And yes, you can tweak it based on what it is that you're doing. These are general though, to help us know how much, how much time goes into each area in the structure of the content. 
So the opening would be a grabber. So for instance, Karen introduced me for this presentation with a couple of questions, three specifically. Those grab your attention, they create relevance and hopefully like they did today, that they name the pain and hand it back to you, the listener, in the form of a question. This also works in marketing. Then they're also listening for what's the significance, and then you can give an overview. Really what they're listening for is, does this relate to me, or can I leave the Zoom room now? Really, that's what they're listening for. So an overview is tell them what you're going to tell them, and already we've taken a look at that, and there was even a slide that says, in this session, you will, because everything is about you. The body of the presentation is really the, the, the main area that people need they they that's why they want to hear the presentation but the opening has got to grab their attention to help them confirm it so the body of the presentation and i learned this from one of the members in my own club voyagers toastmasters in san diego at the el fandango mexican restaurant and desi rhodes was a politician speaking coach so a political speaking coach he was so well known for what he did and helping people maintain their authenticity that they even named one of the sports parks after him, that he was very dedicated to the sports and for the youth in a huge community in San Diego. And here's what he says. So I'm quoting Dusty Rhodes. In the body of the presentation, there's the gotta know. So if your speech got shortened and you know how that happens before, right? You've had that happen. The gotta know is if it your, your time is all of a sudden slashed and you see the green light or the yellow light coming on, that that's where you're going to really give the most amount of value, that this is exactly what they got to know. Followed by that, if you do have more time, then you can go into the need to know. And if more time still, the nice to know. Again, edit from the bottom up in this. Nice to know might not necessarily be a need to know and certainly not a God to know. <laughs> Pardon my slang, but that was how I learned it from Dusty Rhodes. So then the third part of the structure, then after we have the opening, we've grabbed their attention. We're giving them pertinent information of how does that relate to, or maybe we're giving them potential solutions to their problems. Engineers, when you are doing this for debriefs, then that really helps them, adult learning theory. And then the closing is that we summarize it, circle back, and I'll show you that and then create a call to action. What exactly is it that you want people to do as a result? So here's your formula. 10% of the overall time is dedicated to the opening of your presentation. 80% is going to be for the main body of the presentation and the remaining 10% is going to be the closing. Here's how that looks for a seven minute presentation. One minute, and that might seem really short. Most openings though are even less than one minute. Again, with that overview and what's the significance and opening up with questions. The body of the presentation in a seven minute is going to be five. And then the closing is again, one minute for, for wrapping it up. And again, the biggest mistake I think that trainers and speakers and definitely salespeople make is that they forget to give a call to action. What do you want people to do as a result of hearing this particular presentation? Create a sense of urgency. Okay, I'm revved up. Yes, yes, yes. What do I need to do? So what does that look like in a 20 minute then? Two minutes opening, 16 for the body and two minutes again for the closing. All right, so you can see how these parallels work. Well, here's the next concept in this. Begin with the end in mind. And I actually took this photo in at Butchart Gardens in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. I saw these stepping stones. I had no idea how I would be using them, but something said, take this photo. And so here I am quoting Dr. Stephen Covey, who was also a Golden Gavel Award recipient for Toastmasters International. We know him as the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Here's how it relates to us in speaking. Build backward. Begin with the end in mind. Okay, take a breath. This is a big paradigm shifter. Here's how we often start. With a yellow line sheet of paper, we start at the top, we start with the title, and then we work forward. And by the time that we even get to the body of the presentation, we're not even relating to what it was that the topic was about, and we haven't even tapped on what the speech title means. Anyway, am I right? Yeah, because especially when we get 
beyond the body of, and then it's like it, nothing's making sense. Especially when we have a call to action that there is a purpose, there is an, in, an intention of why are we delivering this particular message, begin with it in mind. Begin with what your closing is going to be. What is that critical point that you're going to be making? Build backward, bottom up, build from the ending up to the opening. So if this is going to be your closing, what needs to be included in the body of the presentation to support your point of view? And then massage it back up to the top. And what is the opening? What is going to grab their attention, especially based on where you're going? So build backward, especially in concept. Now you can pull this from the mind mapping and start maybe even on index cards. Remember those we had in, in okay. Index cards, right? Okay. Then the second concept is when you give your presentation, you're still flowing forward. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. But you're structuring it based on what you want people to do as a result. So you give your presentation in the order we normally would. And by the way, usually in this process, in the build backward stage is where the title reveals itself of what to call that presentation. Yes, I've coached contestants to the world championship, one contestant three times, another nine time. And so, yes, yes. And it reveals itself. And it may be that intentional phrase that, all right. So then here's the key, the, the big point on this. I call it the circle back. And it's my concept of, again, from build backwards, flow forward. But when you are working on the closing of your presentation, circle back to the original concept, maybe even the questions that you open with that name the pain. And based on what those pains are and that you are going to have a call to action and potential solutions to their issues, circle back to that. And now you have given them a complete gift and tied a bow on it. By using this technique, it will make structuring and crafting your presentation so much easier than ever before. So, so far, now this is a, a, a brief signpost to recap what we've looked at so far is that we have determined that mind mapping to get into the right brain is going to be easier than doing lined paper. So we go into the mind mapping and we start chunking and we start sorting it out. And then we put it into the body and the structure. Now on the right-hand bottom area of that same handout, we're going to look at the seven communication channels. So on your handout then, the numbered seven areas are going to be referred to as modalities or channels or preferred methodologies. Then in the right-hand column, feel free to take a note on what that type of listener needs. So far, so good. How do you know if you connect with 100% of your listeners? So if your presentations could be any more engaging, and if you want to connect better with all of your listeners, whether it be a speech contest, a fitness program, a training, an engineering debriefing, or if you're one of our instructors at one of the local hospitals or trainers, then even if, and if there's two or more people in a room, then we need to hit all seven of these channels. Now I did extensive research on this. And so I'm bringing it together for you and keeping it really easy. My research is based on these two HP, these PhDs from the early education industry. So early childhood education specifically. So Howard Gardner was the main researcher that I studied. And in his work, and you can Google and find white papers galore. Do your own homework, create your own material, and create your own intellectual property that you can own. Bring concepts together that people have not thought about in a, in a different way that's going to be unique and help people do what it is that they want to do. Thomas Armstrong, his work is called Seven Kinds of Smart, Outstanding Work. Brian Tracy even gets into a lot of detail regarding the research specifically from Thomas Armstrong. So here's my viewpoint 
of the seven preferred main listening channels, just like it were a television. Number one of the seven listening channels is linguistic. So this slide will give you an overview. This is an overview slide. I am telling you what I'm going to be telling you. Then I'll go into detail on each one and provide you the answer for what are the needs of that particular listener. See, I'm pulling back the curtain here so you can see exactly what it is that I'm doing. So number one is linguistic. Number two is math, mathematical scientific, logic, linear, but you can just put the word mathematical. Number three, visual. Number four, musical. Number five, kinesthetic, big word. Kinesthetic, number six, interpersonal. And number seven, intrapersonal. So as you're capturing those, and I'll start queuing up the slides that give you more definition. In every one of our audiences, each of these seven types of listeners exist. So what does that mean if you're entering a speech contest? Wow. Well, the judges and the audience also are comprised of each of these seven different listening channels. Years ago, when I was, I was speaking at District 56 in Galveston, Texas, and it was, and I gave a presentation and I was teaching people how to win the speech contest. Well, two years later from that district, Ramona Smith won the world championship of public speaking. I can tell sitting in an audience or listening to a speaker, especially in a contest, within the first two minutes, if they're going to place, within two and a half minutes, well, actually, even shorter than that, less than two minutes, I know if they're going to place. At the two to three minute mark, I know how they're going to place based on are they using each of these. Ramona absolutely did. Absolutely. All right. So let's break this down. Pull back the curtain even more. All right, so I believe that we need to meet people where they are and to speak on their channels. So even though we may have some strengths and as we go through these other descriptive types of, of for the, each modality that you may think, oh, I don't relate to that. Well, guess what? If you do not bring in that modality, there's someone in your audience you're not connecting with because they need it even if it's not your strength. We have a tendency to speak from our preferred strengths and that's how we connect with other people. Have you ever had that happen where you meet somebody for the very first time and you're going, oh my gosh, we just click. It's like you've known each other forever. Your siblings from different parents. I mean, it's just amazing. You could almost finish each other's sentences. You're speaking the same language. You're on the same channels. And on the flip side of that, have you ever met somebody or you've known somebody for a long time and you've never connected with that person? Yeah, some of us call them <laughs> ex-spouses. Anyway, <laughs> let's take a look at each one of these different categories. Yeah, all my exes live in Texas. <laughs> it's true. All right, so here's group number one, linguistic. So if you want to add to the list of, for the underneath the modality, they are verbal. What they love are the stories, discussions, books, brainstorming, metaphors, analogies. They even know the difference between analogies, acrostics, mnemonics. You know, they know the difference and they're fabulous as grammarian during our meeting. They're quick learners of rhymes and foreign languages, terminology. And what I find for linguistics, it's, it's often true that they speak or dabble in more than one language. Raise your hand if that's true for you. Yeah. So it could be that English is your second or third or even fourth language. I know American is my fluent language. And I, I remember that when I travel internationally. I speak American. They have a really good memory for trivia. Here's what they need from us in our communication. So whether this is in person or online or in a presentation, they need words and semantics. If there is a typographical mistake in a presentation, oh, it's this person's superpower. It's amazing. They can tell what it is. And if we do not use the proper word, the choice of semantic, is it affect? Is it effect? Is it with an A? Is it with an E? Yeah. And phonetically, is it potato? Is it tomato? Is it uh, anyway? You get the idea. So if this could be your superpower, linguistic, you excel at these. And you need to support the people who are in your audience who need to have these as well. 
They also love quotations. Marcus Buckingham, one of our Golden Gavel Award recipients for Toastmasters, a, an, an amazing British author who's now living in the United States, that his work was, oh gosh, let's see, with, with Donald O. Clifton from the Gallup organization, and they created Strength Finders. I strongly recommend it. We want to live by our strengths. All right. So then your linguistic person loves to have quotations. You'll appreciate Stephen Covey. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. And that's exactly what I'm driving home here about is that we need to meet people where they are. So that was group number one. Now is bullet points. Now check this out. Slide, <laughs> slide for number two, mathematical and scientific. They are not bullet points. They are numbered. Exactly. Because this person needs numbers, facts, statistics, and details. In a presentation or reviewing a proposal, they're looking for the patterns and the relationships. One of their strengths is that they're so good at analysis and planning, incredible problem solvers and engineers. In a presentation, if they are listening to you, they need you to give them a sequential presentation. So if you have five different things that you're discussing in a presentation, they must be in that order. You cannot skip, get back to number four and say, oh, and I forgot a point of number two, you will lose credibility. It must be in order. Give them the facts, the details. These people also wanna know on your slides, what's your resource? What's your resource? All right, so that's number two. Are you finding yourself in some of these descriptions? linguistic, mathematical. By the way, these people are great for being in charge of the club treasury and the budget. Yeah, that's one of your superpowers. All right, so here's an example that I bring in from my creative, a creating a positive work environment that there are 10 essentials that employees want. So even though it's grammatically incorrect to have a number in the headline, it is visually correct and supports the mathematicals who are listening to your presentation. So then when you have a number, make sure to number them in the list. And if you're talking about 10.5, then it needs to be 10.5. You would not say just over 10 because these people need to know exactly what that number is. All right, now we go to number three. So visual people, you are, you need to see it. I, I don't know if you noticed or not, but my colors tonight match my slides. Mm -hmm. That's planned. Yep, it's one of the speak like a pro sparkle factors. All right, so visual people, we need to see it. Now notice that their bullet point even looks pretty. Yeah, there you go. And visual people, you like my palm tree. Yep. All right, so then visual people, we need to see it. Show us what you mean. And these people will even say that to you. Say if you're presenting a proposal or something and they say, can you show me what you mean? They need to see a visual aid of some type. That's that's their gift. You know, the mathematical may say, okay, well, what's the bottom line on this? You know, or, or just give me the bottom line on it. And the linguistic person may say, well, tell me more. Visual people, show me. Show me what you mean. So then the question comes up, and this comes from Wharton School of Business. How important are visuals? Visuals to our presentations make them 43% more persuasive, 87% more comprehensible, and increase retention of that information of 14 to 38%. So if you are not using visuals, and, and even though you may say, oh, I don't need to do that for you. Your audience might need it though. It could make or break whether your idea it catches on or your proposal is accepted or not. So this is a strong visual channel. I mean, it would be ideal for each of us to have all seven of them perfectly balanced. Typically, we have preferred different modalities here. So here's number four. Musical, chances are, if you're a musical, there is a song that's repeating in your head. It could be that you just left the car to join this particular Zoom session and that song or that jingle is still in your head. Or you see a meme on Facebook and even though it has the words, you're singing it in what that original song sounds like. So musical rhythmic people, they need 
to have that. They need to have a cadence. One of their gifts is that they remember tunes and lyrics. So for instance, when I opened up for Marie Osmond at a women's conference, there were 3,500 people in that particular huge amphitheater. And I opened for her. She was the luncheon keynote speaker. I, I And I had not planned this. Again, if you're going to memorize your presentation, memorize it and then let it go so that there can be magic in the moment. I ended up taking a spin with, because I was wearing a dress that just, just oh, scalloped, if you will. And it was right when Marie had lost a lot of weight on Jenny Craig. And I started singing, I'm a little bit country. And I thought, oh my gosh, where did that come from? Well, I was raised on Marie, you know, Donnie and Marie. I don't, <clears throat> okay, I just dated myself, All right, You know how old I am. Anyway, it was delightful to meet her later because, and I said, oh, Marie, it's, it, it was my honor to open for you. She says, oh no, Cheryl, I'm your closing act. I thought, oh my gosh, she was just so delightful. Anyway, so tunes and lyrics. Well, how do you bring that into your speaking then? You can bring it in using your vocal variety, the pacing, the pausing, the cadence, the, the pause, the emphasis, the intonation, the inflection, you know, the passion, the advocacy that you put into the tone of your voice can create that musical rhythm that group number four needs. Is this you? Yeah. Uh -huh. Musical people, you're incredible storytellers. So if you are a high mathematical with linguistics, so a one and a four, you are amazing natural storytellers. All right. So high five. Here we go. So group number five is kinesthetic. They need movement. They need touch. They need hands on. They need handouts that I can actually do something with and then I can fill it in. They love to fill in the blanks. It gives them, it, 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 it's comforting, but it gives them value for what they're doing. So if you are, let's say if you're an engineer and you are talking about an issue that's happening inside of your workplace, you could tell them about it, which is linguistic. You could give them the bottom line, which is mathematical. You could show them, which is group number three, maybe number four, there's a song that goes with it, you know, working nine to five, you know, whatever. But kinesthetic group number five, they need to be on site. Take them to where the problem is, where there's a tangible situation that they can, they can, they can feel it. These people are very much in touch with their feelings and the relationship and the feelings of other people as well. So kinesthetic, more hands-on. So they get the high fives on that one. All right. Group number six, Barbara Streisand wrote your song, people, people who need people. Yep. You're the people, people. You love to show up early at sessions such as this because of the networking. You'll probably even stay after the Q&A session and, and until the Zoom room is exited by the host. That you love interaction with other people, especially brainstorming. So you put together a linguistic column one, a visual person three, and a number six. You're going to be clicking, showing exactly what you mean, brainstorming. You are going to make things happen. It's it, That's your gift. Now, if you're group number seven, you are more of the thinkers, and that's your gift. Seven is intrapersonal or introspective. You love things that are your own self-paced information, so now if you're a one linguistic with a seven, we could give you the owner's manual. You will read it by yourself. You will be happy. If you're musical, you might even have some classical music playing in the background that matches the heartbeat so that if you're going to be quizzed on something or a test, then it will help link it into your subconscious. It's amazing. A great book on all the music is called Super Learning. It's by three or four different authors, and it breaks down what type of music for different things. So if you hear group number seven say, I need time to think about it, don't push them. They really do need time to think about it. That's their gift. They often may not speak up during the regular meeting, but they will go away. They'll ponder it. They'll come back with really important questions that need to be answered. Yeah, so raise your hand if that's you. Yep, we need you because you bring in things that we've missed. In this segment, this is a debrief 
of what we just did in the seven listening channels, we've identified that we may have preferences. And if we don't tap into each of the seven, we may miss some of the mark. So how that relates to us in leadership today is through influence, not authority. Another one of our Golden Gavel Award recipients, Dr. Ken Blanchard. So in the chat box, if you would please give me some ideas of how you're going to be using these communication channels. Maybe in your job, by the way, they also relate to parenting. And if you have kids, make sure that you raise them implementing each of the seven different modalities. So go ahead and pop me some notes in the chat box of how you are going to use these communication channels. Nelson Mandela said that if you talk to a man in language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And that's what this is about, is to meet people where they are. Some of the ways that you can apply these skills and feel free to add it to your own list, leading and managing others, giving instruction, your proposals, ideas, networking, job interviewing, either side of the desk, marketing, and definitely parenting as well. So apply these skills. And here's the two tips regarding these seven channels. One-on-one, -on -one, communicate on their levels, on their channels, meet them where they are, speak on their channel. And all of these things, will they'll give you clues. You'll start paying attention. So even after this session and you're connecting with your spouse, your children, or, or a colleague, listen and observe, and they will reveal the cues of what are their preferred channels and then match that and communicate. It's almost like paraphrasing, but it's observing and it's, a, it's authentic, non-manipulative communication. In groups, we need to incorporate each of the seven modalities, even if it's not our own strength. So in this session, this is the debrief of the entire session slide. That's what this does. In this session, you have learned tips to save time crafting any presentation, long or short. You've gained insights into structure and organization using chunking from the mind mapping technique. And now you've also discovered the seven main channels of listening to enhance your communication skills. So with this, we're going to go into Q&A for just a few minutes. And it's been my privilege to bring you some of my top tips on Speak Like a Pro.